What's up, everybody? It's Tom Wojtse Blanca, and we are back with another Explain video where we speed run the retelling of complicated game stories with plenty of jokes along the way. This time, we're discussing Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth, and if you're one of those that can't spare the 55 plus hours to play it, don't worry, I got you. Before we get too deep, this game makes references to the previous games. If you don't know already, check out my Kiryu Saga, Like a Dragon, and Like a Dragon Guide and Explain videos. The game opens up on a stormy night with an elderly couple discussing feeding the homeless. Suddenly, oh shit, there's someone on the road? The driver slams on the brakes, but wait, where did he go? BAM! LA Noir doesn't even hesitate and blasts the driver in the head. What is BAM? Now he's lighting up the old man. BAM! 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 Old lady, dead. L.A. Noir steals a pendant, gives it to the mystery bad guy, and BAM! He gets shot! Less than two minutes into this game and there's already four murders. RGG came out swinging with this one. Three years after the Tojo and Omi dissolution, Ichiban Kasuga is working at a job placement agency, determined to help displace Yakuza and carry on Arakawa's dream. Since the dissolution, ex-Yakuza have been struggling. The government has a five-year ex-Yakuza clause that should be renamed to the fuck ex-Yakuza clause because for the first five years after leaving, they can't fulfill any basic needs to survive in today's world. As you'd imagine, this makes it hard to get hired, so Ichi's doing his best to help them out. They're all catching up and survive because bars will never not be a thing in this franchise, and it's obvious Ichi has a thing for Saiko. The homie barely musters the courage to ask her out, and is all kinds of hype when she says yes. Your heart cannot help but go out to our man as he dances with the random homeless people to celebrate. The day goes exactly how you'd expect, but that night Ichi goes off, bearing his soul, and because this man has no chill, he fucking proposes. What? Saiko doesn't say a word. She just slowly starts walking toward the edge like she's about to jump, but Ichi doesn't let up as he continues to dig his own grave. She thanks him for the date and leaves our guy hanging while she just walks off. One year later, she's not returning his text, but the homie is still focused on helping ex Yakuza. Unfortunate for that because he just got fired. And on his way home, he runs into the dregs of society. I'm talking bottom of the barrel humanity where evolution actually took a step backwards. Cloud chasing content creators. Our dude just got fired and these assholes got their phones on his face. Asshole number one looking like Atsuko's grandson says Ichi's all over the internet. Huh? And if you thought internet cloud chasers were bad, now we get clickbait anime VTubers. This is the Tatara channel, a 5 million sub VTuber that does call out videos exposing corruption among celebrities, politicians, and other areas. But this time they take Ichi's situation completely out of context when they say he's using his job to make Exikuza commit crimes. Assholes try to extort our man but end up catching these unemployed hands. Namba says the video about Ichi was dropped three days ago and it has over 3 million views. And of course everyone believes Tatara's story, not only because they're all anime simps, but because it has built up a credible reputation with past stories. One month later, Ichi's being a bum in his underwear until his homies pull up. Adachi says the Serayu clan's being suspicious. After old man Hoshino died in the last game, Takabe took over, but now he's in jail. But even though he's in jail, large numbers of ex Yakuza are gathering at Serayu, including the last guy Ichi tried to help. Ichi cannot stand by and watch some guy he barely knows get dragged back into the Yakuza, so he grabs his bat, blows his hair back out, and has more hallucinations about being a hero. Uh, yeah. They sneak into Serai HQ, beat the hell out of the clan, and find the Serai clan captain, Ebina. Ebina takes them to a storage warehouse specializing in controversial items or quote-unquote waste. However, it also provides jobs for the many ex Yakuza suffering from the five-year clause, including the guy Ichi came to see. Ebina also says they're planning the second great dissolution, or the dissolution of the remaining Yakuza groups, but they want to make sure there are enough jobs to go around first. Ebina claims he's continuing Arakawa's dream, Ichi's convinced, and then they're all leaving. But hold up, Captain Sawashiro? He killed Chairman Hoshino in the last game. The hell is he doing here? Well, not quite. Aoki had a hitman kill Hoshino, pinned it on Sawashiro, and now Sawashiro simply accepted his fate. His way of taking responsibility for the bullshit his son pulled in the last game. Ebina somehow knew the truth, got Sawashiro out of prison, and they are now working together to gather Exikuza under the Serayu and push forward the Second Great Dissolution. Later, Sawashiro has a favor to ask of Ichi. He wants Ichi to go to Hawaii to meet someone, his mother. Sawashiro confirms Ichi's really Arakawa and Akane's son and drops some more background. Arakawa was originally in the Hikawa family and the patriarch wanted him to marry his daughter. Arakawa was like, sorry fam, I love Akane, to which the patriarch said, fuck you, you can both die. Arakawa heard Hikawa hitman found Akane, say that 10 times fast, so he single-handedly raids Hikawa HQ, fucks up all his boys, and tortures the patriarch until he dies. Years passed until he got a tip that she was in Hawaii. He sent Sawashiro to find her, but to protect his own son, the young master, Sawashiro planned to kill her. <gasps> 
but didn't because it was obvious that Akane didn't want to be found. Sawashiro told Arakawa that Akane was dead, and that was the end of it until recently. In prison, Sawashiro sent a letter to Akane telling her everything, and now she wants to meet her son. He gives Ichi her address, who agrees to go so he can give her Arakawa's ashes. After landing in Hawaii, Ichi helps this wheelchair guy get off the plane, but then gets a gun pulled on him by his own taxi driver. Welcome to America! Taxi driver tries to rob our man, but Ichi calls him out like, You won't, pussy! Rightfully so, Ichi kicks his ass, but don't forget, we're in America! Taxi guy calls the cops, starts playing the victim, and these idiots fall for it. Then this asshole eats Akane's address. Why? Ichi's been in Hawaii for an hour and is already getting arrested until wheelchair guy rolls up. Literally. He tells the cops the truth and has video evidence, but taxi guy manages to run away because cops in these games are completely useless no matter what country they're from. Wheelchair guy was following Ichi because he thought taxi guy was sus. He wanted to make sure Ichi was good since he helped him while he was on the plane. Wheelchair guy's name is Eiji and offers to help Ichi get Akane's address from the video he took. They head back to his place to get the address, but then a gang pulls up with taxi guy, whose name is now Tomizawa. Leader of the gang walks in, Ichi's over here like, Dude looks like a modern day pirate. Which is funny because dude really looks like a Yakuza Jack Sparrow. Captain, Captain Jack Sparrow. We'll just call him Yamai. Yamai wants revenge for Tomizawa, catches hands when Ichi knocks him out, and they get away. The two part ways and Ichi finally makes it to Akane's house. Nervous as all hell, he musters the courage to open the door and then finds this random girl who's not Akane. Her name is Chitose, is working as Akane's housekeeper. As she continues to serve drinks, things become increasingly suspicious until Ichi passes out. She drugged him? The next morning, Ichi is on the beach messed up like a frat boy in spring break, but ass naked. But I'm more concerned about how these blind tourists don't notice his little dragon hanging out until after he gets up. Fucking Chitose stripped this man clean and left his ass on the beach. Three days into a Hawaiian vacation, our man gets arrested. No ID, no passport, nothing. And because he's a John Doe, these crooked ass cops want to pin a six month old mugging on him. They're just as bad as the Japanese cops. And I mean that competent wise too, because Ichi manages to body both of them and runs out the front door and escapes in sandals and handcuffs. Then he gets stopped by some mystery guy and released? Kidu-san? Kidu's old ass is over here looking like Persona 4 is you, and when he starts talking, I immediately stop the game and change the voiceovers back to Japanese. He frees Ichi, gives him a ride, and says he's in Hawaii on a mission for the Daidoji faction. Kidu helps Ichi cop a fresh fit and does exactly what you'd expect after that. Take him to a bar. They need to get Ichi's passport back, so they head back to Akane's house and find out the person Kidu is looking for is also Akane. Oh, that's interesting. What does the government spy ring want with Ichi's mom? Of course, no one knows, but we can't figure that out now because Yamai's here. They try to slip out the back until Tomizawa shows up with another gun. We all know he won't do it, but Ichi does the Ichi thing and makes a friend out of the guy who tried to rob him. Yamai pulls up like, stop being a pussy, shoot this bitch. Then Kiru does this Kiru inspirational speech thing causing Tomozawa to have a panic attack, turn around, and nearly blow Yamai's head clean off. But his Resident Evil ass doesn't even flinch, just checks the bullet hole and lets them escape after they whoop on Yamai's crew. Tomizawa says they too are after Akane, but doesn't know why. Who is this lady? Ichi's just trying to see his mom, and now the whole underworld's after her? They regroup at Kiru's hotel, realize Chitosi is their only lead, and pursue Ichi's passport to try and find her. Luckily, Tomizawa knows a guy who deals in black market passports. Jeff. My name is Jeff. They meet Jeff, whose fat ass looks like the personification of Banjo Tooie's Big Al, and he explains Chitose used the passport to buy entry into District 5, or Barracuda's home turf. The only way they're getting into District 5 is through a dirty cop named Roman. And of course, they find him at a bar. Roman's your typical asshole cop, tries to extort the homies, and then points a gun at them because America. He gets straight leveled by the dragon, agrees to wipe Ichi's charges and bring them to District 5. They head back to Kiryu's hotel, talk about fresh starts, and Kiryu's getting sentimental about living every moment to the fullest. You, uh, you good, Kiryu? I've got cancer. <gasps> no! And he has half a year left, at most. Three years earlier, Kiryu was working at a radioactive waste storage facility. Some random guy driving the forklift decided to have a heart attack, and Kiryu gets exposed trying to save him. Naturally, Ichi's freaking out, but Kiryu's already accepted his fate. Nothing else can be done. They get to District 5, Hawaii's version of Homeless Shawshank, get stopped by the gang, Roman gets gut like a fish, Damn! and the homies have to fight their way through until Kiryu's cancer picks the worst time to start acting up. They hide in a storage room, and oh shit, it's Chitose? Chitose says she was looking for her paycheck and set Ichi up because she didn't want to get reported for trespassing. Chitose went to District 5 in an attempt to disappear as she doesn't want any of her actions to get out because she is the heiress to the very wealthy and powerful Fujinomiya family. 
Chitose found a data sheet on Akane because the Barracudas are looking for her too. God found snooping, and now she's running from the Barracudas because she's been branded a traitor. They decide to partner up, Kiryu's magically feeling better, and the four of them fight their way to the Barracudas boss. They get to this nice ass penthouse and run into the leader of the Barracudas, Dwight. He's pissed Chitose betrayed him. Sorry, what? Chitose was being blackmailed to lead Ichi into a trap, but she didn't do it because he's the best boy. Of course information needs to be beaten out of Dwight, Machete tries to gut our crew with dual machetes, but instead gets uppercut with a metal bullhead. Bodied! They're looking for Akane, but don't know why. The job came from an anonymous source. Akane is an orphanage director, so that's their next stop. But again, no one knows where she is. The orphanage is also part of Palakana, a Hawaiian religion that worships the volcano lady named Nele. The home is also here about Nele Island, a sacred land only accessible to the sage and his chosen. They help with some charity work by giving hands to the punks shaking down locals, and as fate would have it, the sage of Palakana appears. His name is Bryce. I call him Hawaiian Jesus. Hawaiian Jesus shows concern for Akane's disappearance, but doesn't have any useful information because no one does. During this conversation, Chitose disappears. She slipped away and is talking about earning Ichi's trust to some unknown caller. Is she playing him again? The group is out of leads and doesn't know how to find Akane, but what if she found them? Chitose suggests the most Gen Z shit ever by making a video, hoping it goes viral and Akane might be inclined to reach out to her son. Not the worst idea in the world with Ichi's charisma and thirst trap physique. They get the film they need, and while Chitose is editing, Ichi helps the turtle demon in a cracked out Muppet build a five star island resort. The video gets uploaded, and they get a DM from Eiji, the wheelchair homie. They meet up, Ichi fills them in on everything, and Eiji offers to help. The reunion is interrupted by the punks that Ichi rocked the other day, but this time there's more. This time we find out they're part of the Ganja, Hawaii's Chinese mafia. They want Ichi because they're looking for Akane too. Who is this woman? Because punks jump up to get beat down, the crew drops all 20 ganja, but when we head back to the hotel, it's fucking Yamai again. I guess every game has to have a Kuze. Yamai calls Kiryu out, who does the annoying who me thing he did all through Like a Dragon Gaiden, throws away his nice jacket, gets his ass beat because he can't take a hint, and leaves without his jacket. Since the hotel's been compromised, Kiryu takes everyone to the Daidoji hideout, where they meet Hanawa. Their next lead is the Ganja. Rumor has it that Nirvana Hotel owner Wong To is the Ganja official and has the secret high roller casino that he frequents, but none of them could possibly get in, except maybe the heir to the Fujinomiya dynasty. Chitose pulls some strings, they go secret spy mode, and Kiryu reminds us all that he's still a man of culture. You, you son, what the hell are you doing? Just giving you a little change of scenery. To shows up and immediately knows who they are. Again, glasses aren't the best cover. To takes them to his office and attacks them when Ichi doesn't tell him what he wants to know. Unfortunately for him, he underestimates how hard-headed Ichi really is and gets dropped. To makes a last-ditch effort to escape, Kiryu's like, fuck that, and Ronaldo kicks a fucking desk chair straight into this man's back. Sit your ass down! Also, where did Tomi get a sword? To spills that his gang and the Barracudas were looking for Akane for someone called the Overseer, the person that rules the entire Hawaiian underworld. Like the Ejin 3, their Barracudas and Ganja are two sides of the same coin. Toe said too much, and his guard asserts his betrayal will not go unpunished. He gives the signal by jumping out the tower window and killing himself? The fuck is going on? The guy was an overseer spy, his death was the signal, and Toe says if they can get him to safety, he'll tell them everything he knows. The group does what they do best by punching everything, but Toe gets stabbed. They drag his maimed ass into the woods and give him a chance to rest while Tomi looks for a ride. The overseer has spies everywhere, even the police and gangs, and the lengths they'll go to for him are straight up cult level brainwashing. But who? Who has that kind of influence? Fucking Hawaiian Jesus. Holy shit. Wait. So the entire religion that Akane dedicated herself to is after her? Why? It's the girl that she's with, Lani. Bryce wants Lani dead because she could ruin his whole plan. Toe snitched him because he wanted revenge since Bryce sent his mother's head to him in a box. What's in the box? We still don't know why Lani is important, but Akane is on the run to protect this 10 year old girl. With a ton of new information, there's no time to think because Yamai is looking for them with the same coat he left after the last fight. Yamai flushes them out, but the homies are able to fight back until Tomi rolls up with a car. Kiryu's cancer is acting up again, and he sacrifices himself so the others can get away. Now we need to go save Kiryu. Tomizawa might know where he is, and right when they need it most, Ichi gets a call from the Japan homies. They are bored, so they flew over to help. Adachi and Namba get caught up. They all head to Yamai's territory, beat the shit out of some goons who say Kiryu is in the theater building, where they beat the shit out of more goons until they find Yamai with body positive cabaret girls. As always, nothing useful said until you beat it out of them, so we're fighting Yamai. Again. 
After reminding Yamai to sit his ass down, they find Kiryu in a makeshift infirmary. Yamai told his people to take care of Kiryu because he once looked up to the dragon of Dojima. Yamai admits that he was only after Akane because everyone else was. Ichi fills him in, and he agrees to call off the hunt. Yakuza have more honor than preying on kids. Kiryu's back at the hideout and wakes up to a full-on intervention. You need to chill the fuck out, Kiryu. You're old as fuck, cancer as fuck, and have people that got your back now. Stop doing this lone wolf tough guy carrier one's burden bullshit that you've been doing for eight games. Surprisingly, Kiryu agrees, passes the torch off to Ichi, and heads back to Japan with Nanba. Knowing the truth about Hawaiian Jesus, they go back to the orphanage, but something's off. Inside, they find Bryce indoctrinating, I mean, teaching the orphan kids, teaching him how to be cult fucking psychopaths. He has to fight all of Bryce's fanatics, and afterwards tells the orphanage workers what happened. They say many of the orphans there are chosen and sent to Nele Island. That's where they're likely groomed and sent back to infiltrate gangs, cops, even politics. Shout out to blind religious faith. Now we're Kiru. The doctor informs Namba Kiru's condition is getting worse, and his stubborn ass refuses to take it easy, like he's given up on fighting cancer and is rushing toward his death. Kiru's staying at Ichi's place, and Namba shows up with Sun Hee. They take a cancer patient out for a night in the town, including Cabaret Club, where they recruit Saiko for Operation to Help Kiru Fight Cancer. They take Kiru to survive for karaoke. Unfortunately for me, I forgot to switch it back to Japanese, so when he says, I guess I just have a voice nobody wants to hear anymore, I couldn't agree more. While parting, Sun He gets a call, and Serayu clan are growing too fast, and something's up. Especially since the Serayu are moving their disposal business to Hawaii. This is sus. So they hit up Sawashiro for answers since he sent Ichi to Hawaii. He's at the new Serai HQ, the same location as the old Tojo HQ. They really will do anything to reuse assets, won't they? Ebina explains their waste disposal business is in a partnership with Palakana. He needed Sawashiro for the second great dissolution, learned about Akane and Palakana through him, and dug deeper to learn about the waste management business. Palakana even has their own island where they run a waste disposal facility. Wait, now the island is being used for waste storage? And Ebina is sending Yakuza there to work the facility? But what about Ichi? Sawashiro simply sent him to reunite with Akane, and Ebina claims they don't know about the Lani situation. Hmm. Eventually, Kiryu finally gets some rest, but when he wakes up, no way. The Tatara channel got him too? This fucking thirst trap VTuber tells 5 million subs his history with the Yakuza, how he faked his death, shows footage of him and Ichi, and has an interview with Ebina and Sawashiro as these two assholes confirm his identity and say he met with them wanting to resurrect the Tojo. What the fuck? The Daidoji are gonna be pissed. They head to the Serayu clan in Ijincho, run into that degenerate who stole Atsuko's jacket, and Q gives him one for all of us pissed off by his entitled bullshit. He calls in backup, fuck your backup, and they learn enough to assume Ebina and the Tatara channel are all connected. Now we're back in Hawaii, a few days prior as Kiryu and Namba are just arriving in Japan. Ichi's still looking for leads, and Toe suggests Akane's last known location, Yamai's territory. With no better option, they check it out, run into more Palakana inbreds, Yamai joins the fun, and they work together to clear them out. Yamai says, now get the fuck out of my hood. Ichi's all like, help us if you're real Yakuza. Get bent, Jufro. You just scared of Bryce. The fuck you say? Super fire crowbar power. And for the fifth time, we're fighting Yamai's gang. He really is Kuze. After throwing him on his ass for the millionth time, Yamai agrees to shelter Akane if she's found. And then they're approached by the resident old lady hardass. She takes them out in the middle of the ocean and... <gasps> Akane and Lani? Even though there are a thousand questions that need answers, Lani's safety is top priority, so Yamai secures transport to the Daidoji safe house where they'll be transported to Japan. Despite the impending danger Akane and Lani are facing, Ichi decides to escort with the car window down. Never knowing her parents and with a deceased grandmother, Lani ended up in the orphanage where she met Akane, carrying the Palakana pendant and a will written by the then sage. Now that's pretty fucking interesting. Right? But if you haven't pieced it together yet, let me help. The will states Hawaiian Jesus is a false idol, and the true successor is Lani. Holy shit! Akane also mentions the last sage and his wife were killed in a robbery. Holy shit! You mean the very first scene of the game? Bryce stole the pendant, but his was fake. Bryce wants Lani dead because she could expose all of his corruption as this true sage. Holy shit! They get to the Daidoji safe house, and Eiji is being sus. Chitose calls him out, saying he's been blackmailing her this whole time. I'm sorry, what? Then she flips his handicapped ass over and says he's a fake cripple. What? Eiji worked with Ebina and used the wheelchair bit to get close to Ichi, as Chitose sees Dwight on FaceTime. What? 
Palakana thugs bust in and it's an all out brawl for Lonnie. Akane gets slapped, Hanawa and Toe get shot, dudes are throwing couches, it's fucking madness. When the dust settles, Lonnie and Eiji are gone, Akane's unconscious and Hanawa and Toe are dead. This is when Kiryu calls and as you can see, everything is fucked, especially now that Eiji is connected to Ebina and Bryce. Ichi starts spiraling, Kiryu tells him to man the fuck up, but wait, what do you mean he was blackmailing you, Chitose? With the cops on the way, there's no time to truly explain, but what she does say is that she is Tatara. No fucking way. Eiji writes the scripts and she reads them, all under Ebina's orders. Ichi was sent to Hawaii in an effort to draw a Kanade for Bryce, and Eiji's been watching him since he got off the plane. What about Sawashiro? Ichi's convinced he's not in on it, so Kiru tests his theory. After beating Sawashiro down, he begs Kiru to get him out of there so they could speak freely. Bet. Sawashiro admits he sent Ichi to Hawaii before learning Ebina's second great dissolution is a front to bring in recruits. He's still committed to fulfilling Arakawa's dream by seeing the second great dissolution through. He also believes the disposal business has something to do with nuclear waste. The same waste that gave Kiru cancer as the web of connection grows more complicated. Bryce has been storing the world's nuclear waste on Nele Island for years, raking in massive profits, and now Ebina's getting a cut by sending Yakuza labor and brokering a deal between Japan and Palakana. Japan's corrupt elite want to start the nuclear industry to make more money, but the waste has been the biggest issue. Sending it to Nele Island is their solution. No waste in Japan equals public and legislative approval. Legislative approval means Ebina and Bryce are technically doing all of this legally. On top of all this, Ebina has an ulterior motive that Sawashiro can't figure out. Back in Hawaii, Akane's still knocked out, but Shitose's gone. Is she going after Lani alone? As they search for her, they meet with the other Daidoji operatives and go over what they know. The Daidoji wanted Lani to stop the deal. They believe Palakana's plan would hurt the long-term prosperity of Japan, where the current government only cares about the short-term profit. They also profile Eiji, who is a reporter that got fired after a hit and run. He claims he was set up by the Arakawa family. After being fired, Eiji joined Bleach Japan, and after that, he sides with Ebina. They get a text from Chitose, rush to the club she's at, fight their way in, and find Eiji's smug, partridge family haircut, head ass, chilling in the back. Chitose sneaks up, ready to blow his ego right out of his head. Lani's delivered, Chitose gets her arms sashimied, Eiji tries to get away and somehow gets her wheelchair up the stairs in the literal 15 seconds it took Ichi to catch up. Because Eiji is a sick fuck, he gives Lani a pipe bomb and pushes her down the stairs. You know it's intense for no reason other than the fact that this whole scene is in slow motion. Chitose saves Lani, but oh shit, Ichi misses the bomb. Adachi and Tomi just watch it fly by because they want to die apparently and boo! Wait, it's not a bomb? No, but it is tear gas. Chitose tries to save Lani but brings her straight to Eiji as he gets away. With Lani gone, they take some time to regroup, and Chitose finally explains why she's been fucking everything up since chapter 3 of this game. Four years ago, she started the Tatara channel to escape her overbearing controlled life. One year later, there was a Fujinomiya scandal that cost people their lives. Chitose's father tried to cover it up, but Chitose wanted to do the right thing by exposing the corruption on her channel. As a small streamer, no one cared until Eiji found her, turned Chitose's simple drawings into an anime wet dream, and fed her a provocative script. The video went viral and motivated by justice, the two operated Tatara jointly. They outed more corruption and the channel grew like crazy. But over time, Eiji's stories got wilder and targeted ex-Yakuza. Chitose wanted out, but Eiji said he would reveal her identity if she left. So she forced herself to read the next script, Ichi's smear campaign. Because he's the best boy, Ichi forgives her. Group morale restored, they head back to Yamai's, but now his own people are trying to bust the door down. Dwight pulled a godfather, made an offer they couldn't refuse, and Yamai's people turned. And during all this, we finally learn Eiji's motivation is to make all Yakuza suffer. Ebina will somehow make that happen once they get the girl. Ichi's like, fuck that, and kicks some traitor ass, but there's too many. They can't get through. Say less, as they beat down two back holes into submission, commandeer one, and dukes of hazard that shit across the street and into Yamai's hideout. We won't talk about how they all just got up unharmed. They suplex their way through the rest of the traders and quell the uprising. Ichi's in a rush to save Lani, but Yamai tells them to take a minute. Meet your mother before you get yourself killed. What do you even say to the woman who stuffed your newborn ass in a locker? Well, in a heartfelt scene, Ichi thanks Akane for getting knocked up. He wouldn't be here without her. He gives her Arakawa's ashes, they are completely overwhelmed with emotion, and we're back to Kiru. Sawashiro needs help to see the second great dissolution through and begs Kiru to assemble the Yakuza's Mount Rushmore. The OG legends themselves, Daigo, Taiga, and Majima. <laughs> they went into hiding and Kiru's the only one that can drag them back out. 
They hitchhiked their way to this raggedy ass shack, and the once proud legends must have fallen hard because now they all look homeless. Homeless Daigo explains after the dissolution they formed a security company to help Exekuza survive the five year clause, and everything was going great at first. Then the fucking Satara channel started running stories about the company any scandal could get their fake hentai hands on. Clients pulled out, and as things fell apart, the Yakuza life started calling back to Daigo's employees. They heard about Ebina, did a background check, and learned Ebina's not his real name. He changed it after his mother died. He's really Hikawa. Holy shit! Don't get it? Let me explain. Ebina's mother is the daughter of the Hikawa family patriarch, the same patriarch that pressured Arakawa to marry his daughter, and tried to kill Arakawa and Akane when Arakawa broke off the engagement. However, before Arakawa said no, he tapped that and knocked her up, but didn't know a bun was in the oven when he single-handedly murdered her father and the entire clan. That means that Ebina is Arakawa's kid. That means that Ebina is Ichi's half-brother. Holy shit! It stands to reason Ebi is not a fan of the Yakuza, explaining his relationship with Eiji, but why go through all the trouble of leading the Serayu in the waste disposal plan? Kiru then shares Sawashira's request. Finish what you started and help me see this through. Daigo's depressed ass is all like, there's nothing we can do. Then your homeless asses can keep your excuses and rot. You better check yourself, Kiru. Get your bitch hands off me. Majima starts throwing knives, Kiyu's people are ready to throw hands, and here it is, a full-on brawl with three of the most legendary Yakuza this franchise has ever seen. Kiru gives them his famous post-fight hero speech and walks off like the badass he is. As they're getting back to Ijincho, Tatara starts spreading more fake news. The guy who Kiru hitchhiked with got filmed of the recent meeting, and Big Teddy Tabloid over here is convincing everyone he's really trying to resurrect the Tojo. In a later livestream, Ebina announces the Serayu and Japanese government's plan to dispose nuclear waste on Nele Island and how they're using Serayu clan members as labor. But wait a second, they're not Serayu clan members anymore. Ebina just dissolved the Serayu into Bleach Japan. They're back? Still trying to find a way to Nele Island, Ichi and the homies get jumped by cultists and end up hiding at a local shrine. Even though we're in the second to last chapter, RGG throws another playable character at us as Jungi Han randomly shows up for basically no reason. The Gomi Jewel got their swordfish on, hacked a government satellite, and now know the location of Nele Island and a cargo ship used to transport supplies from the mainland. This could have easily been sent in an email five chapters ago. They go back to the homeless Shawshank and body the entire Barracuda gang as they fight their way toward the hidden dock. They find Dwight and Lonnie, he threatens the killer, Little Fish has some bite, and Ichi's crew remind him he ain't shit. Dwight then grabs a noob tube, but forgets rule number one, aim at the feet. Boom! Everything is exploding. Boom! Including Dwight's face. Lonnie and Akane are reunited, but with Palakana spice everywhere, they have no idea how to get to Japan. Because Yamai's the homie now, he has an idea. Yamai randomly has this tugboat, so they take that until they get picked up by a Japanese Coast Guard. But first, Dwight's dumbass is back because no one can take a hint in this damn game. But this time, oh shit! Bruce is out here eating people? Dwight gets beat down again and tries to escape, but when they said fish are friends, not food, I guess they forgot about barracudas. <laughs> they get to the Japanese Coast Guard and Date's waiting for them. Yamai is turning himself in for the murder he committed and in return, demanded safe harbor for Ichi and his people. Now the media is running the fake Kiryu story and all of Japan is against our people. Luckily, the chief of Injincho's homeless camp is still on their side as offers them temporary shelter. Trying to figure out a plan, Ichi gets a call from Ebina? He's baiting Ichi with Sawashiro and wants to meet tomorrow night. And I'll give you one guess where he's at. Fucking Millennium Tower. Real talk. At this point, the biggest plot twist RGG could ever do in any of these games is not have the final boss fight at Millennium Tower. To make things worse, Bleach Japan and the Nuclear Disposal Project has been approved by the Japanese government and they'll start shipping waste in Serayu to Nele Island tomorrow. With religious protections, Nele Island is essentially a black box. Once the Serayu members get there, they'll be Palakana slaves, dumping waste for the rest of their lives. With two problems in two different places, Kiryu and Ichi step aside to figure things out. Kiryu's motivated to go after Ebina. He feels responsible for not changing the Yakuza when he was chairman of the Tojo and wants to make up for it. Everything else will be left to Ichi as he'll go to Hawaii. Kiryu will take care of the Yakuza's past while Ichi's responsible for its future. Shit is deep. Ichi then gives Kiryu his own hero speech, telling Kiryu not to throw his life away. Then the Daidoji rep shows up at the camp. They're pissed Kiryu's identity got out, but please they secured Lani. After everyone falls asleep, Chitose sneaks off. The hell is she up to now? The next morning, shit gets real. Kiryu fixes his hair and puts on the most conic suit in gaming. That's right, I said it. 
The Kiryu we know and love is fucking back. A little older and grayer, but he's fucking back. Ichi and the Hawaii homies head out to Nele Island, but of course it never goes as planned because fucking Jaws jumps out on the boat trying to eat all their asses. They manage to fight off a shark bigger than the damn boat itself, find Nele Island, and knock out a bunch of banana soup brines. It's peanut butter jelly time! And somehow get into a fight with COVID blooper. Yo, get this man a tissue. Eventually they make it to Bryce and his nasty ass garbage dump full of nuclear waste. Bryce starts spewing more cold bullshit, even blaming his own faithful for following him. And if that doesn't make sense, we won't even get into the fact that he's been sage for over 70 years. Hawaiian Jesus? Nah. Now we're fighting the cult crib keeper. As with any bad guy who monologues too much, Bryce says Nele Island was his goal the whole time, where countries can easily dump their secrets. This provides Bryce a nice profit, but also leverage and influence over the world's elite. The previous age wanted to sell the island, which forced Bryce to kill him and take over. No more talking, as Ichi rips off his suit and lets everyone know it's about to go back. Bryce sends guards with swords and Uzis, sit your ass down. Desperate to stop Ichi, Bryce invokes the holy power of 9mm, but Ichi smites 9 blasphemy when he decks him in his heathen ass face. Ass kicked, Bryce still thinks he's untouchable. Too many countries are involved in this scandal. They won't let it get out. Until... Chitose finally uses her channel for good, exposing the entire dump on the Tatara channel. She even put Bleach Japan, Bryce, and the Fujinomiya group on blast. When Chitose snuck out the night before, she confronted her father and convinced him to come clean. Speaking of, Chitose then decides to expose herself, telling her entire following the truth about Tatara's corruption. Bryce makes one last effort to go out like a bitch, but Ichi's like, fuck that, grabs dude's foot and straight up strongman keg tosses this 90 year old dude 20 feet into the air. Old man has to be all kinds of broken right now. Trade that pennant in for a damn life alert. Now it's Kiryu's turn as he and the homies head for Millennium Tower. Of course there are Sarayu everywhere, but Kiryu has had enough of this bullshit. He goes off like all you franchise OGs when he first played like a dragon. Fuck this turn-based combat. Hands, 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 hands. And don't forget, no Millennium Tower raid is complete without a helicopter. So here you go. The crew's completely pinned down until no way. The OG legends are here? Taiga can't shoot a rocket to save his life, but at least they can still fight as we're treated to one of the baddest scenes in the entire game. Kiryu's dropping people like he's not old as dirt and has cancer. Daigo's trying to stay relevant because let's be real, no one really cares about him that much. Taiga's tossing dudes by their faces again, and Majima's crazy ass is out for more blood. All the old fans are losing their minds, and you new fans better fucking recognize. Shit is crazy. The homies continue to fight their way to the top of the tower, as Kiryu reminds us how he never kills anyone. And finally, they make it to Ebina. Sawashiro has clearly seen better days as Ebina describes the burden the Hikawa family's destruction put on him and his mother, and his seething hatred for Arakawa. Arakawa's death ruined Ebina's chance for revenge, but that just meant he would have to get revenge on the collective group. He gathered displaced Yakuza and planned to send them all to Nele Island to live out their lives doing radioactive slave labor. After some more monologuing, Ebina ruins a perfectly good suit by ripping it off. Shout out to Kiryu's tailor because he's been doing this since the 80s, and RGG legit forgot to age Kiryu from the neck down. For real, he's 55 with cancer. Who looks like that? Regardless, it is finally here. The last battle. They straight beat the shit out of each other, Rocky style. Ebina thinks he's smooth with that sword. Fuck your sword. And then Q catches the man with the Shroyuken. A beat up Ebina calls Kiryu out like, kill me or I'll keep coming back. A normal person would end it right there. Fuck this guy. But remember, Kiru doesn't kill. Instead, his wise old self empathizes with Ebina, begs him for forgiveness, and asks him to give the Yakuza a chance to change. Then he passes out. No! Kiru, wake up! Ichi's back in Japan, finds a messed up Eiji, and uses the power of friendship to convince Eiji to turn himself in. While Ichi's carrying Eiji to the police station, Kiru's getting airlifted to the hospital. Credits. No, screw your credits. A month later, the gangs shall not survive. AG, Ebina, and Bryce have all but vanished because now the world has the attention span of a goldfish. Shout out to social media. Lani is the new sage of Palakana, but we'll have Akana and Tomizawa to help out as she rebuilds. Chitose finally becomes the Fujinomiya chairwoman and is cleaning up her family's mess. Ichi finally drops the L word and tells Saiko how he really feels. She seems happy, but doesn't say it back. But it's not like Ichi really gave her a chance because he immediately makes another dumbass move, causing Saiko to storm off. Now we're at the hospital and no, is that really Haruka and Haruto? 
With a renewed determination to live, Kiru decides to fight his cancer. It probably helps that he got his name and his true identity back. But let's be real, Kiru's not going anywhere. RGG will probably Futurama this man before they let him die. And that's like a dragon infinite wealth. Fun fact, according to the CNBC article that was released less than a month after this game, Ebina's real. Work of fiction, my ass. If you enjoy these videos, please be sure to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, or don't. I'm not going to tell you how you live your life. Don't forget to let me know in the comments what other games do you guys want to see. We've already done a ton of other explain videos, so make sure you check those out as well. I'm Luente Blanca, and I'll catch you guys next time.